today we are going to discuss section 9 of the code of civil procedure section 9 of the code of civil procedure is the foundation of every type of suits as it gives rise to the jurisdiction of the court to try and decide the suits in order to understand the legal implications of section 9 I will read section 9 to you before we start discussing on the same. The heading of the section is Court to try all civil suits unless barred. So this heading gives us a bird's eye view of what is contained in the entire section. The section starts, the court shall subject to the provisions herein contained have jurisdiction to try all suits of a civil nature, excepting suits of which uh, their cognizance is either expressly or impliedly barred. Now we have to, when we read a section, it has to be split up in various parts because there are various ingredients of a section. Firstly, this section will apply to the word code, courts. It should be a court. Court means a court established under the provisions of the Constitution of India throughout the entire territory of India. Now, it shall be subject to the provisions contained herein contained. That means if there is a provision which is repugnant to or contrary to what has been contained in the entire code of civil procedure, it shall be subject to the same. Then have jurisdiction. Now this word jurisdiction is of most important importance in the sense that jurisdiction is of various kinds. In understand in order to understand the word jurisdiction, we have to interpret it in a simple way. Suppose we define India. When we see the map of India, there is a line which divides India or which separates India from the other countries. So, as far as that line is concerned, the jurisdiction of India will relate only up to that line and not beyond that. Similarly, jurisdiction means Jurisdiction is of three types. Now, you will wonder that how jurisdiction can be of three types. There are three types of jurisdiction. One is territorial jurisdiction. Second is pecuniary jurisdiction. And third is inherent jurisdiction. Now, firstly we take the territorial jurisdiction. India is divided into various states. States have been divided further into various districts and the districts have been again divided into various states. Courts are situated in every district court, in every district of India which is known as a district court. Now that court will have jurisdiction over the entire district. Now then there is a division of the courts also. District is divided into tassils. There are various tassils. Tassils in various tassils civil courts have been established. Now in civil court, uh, civil uh, in those tassils there are civil judges and the civil courts are there. So, oh, as far as the district is concerned, district courts will have jurisdiction over the tehsil of that particular district and regarding the other tehsils, they will have jurisdiction, territorial jurisdiction regarding the area which falls or which is designated to fall in their jurisdiction. So, every suit which arises within the jurisdiction of a particular court will have to be tried at that very court 
it is not that every suit can be tried in the district courts alone the suit or the cause of action which has accrued within the jurisdiction of a particular seal has to be decided over there then comes the pecuniary jurisdiction pecuniary means financial jurisdiction pecuniary jurisdiction has been defined in section 6 of the code of civil procedure every court has been given the power to try suits up to a particular limit earlier there was division of pecuniary jurisdiction into various parts but now a days that has been abolished every civil court will have unlimited jurisdiction as far as the pecuniary court is pecuniary jurisdiction is concerned if a new court is established and a new judge who joins the duty as jurisdiction over a particular amount beyond that amount the case has to be transferred to another civil civil judge who has the jurisdiction so pecuniary jurisdiction is thus divided on the basis of the value of the suit similarly earlier in the district courts also there was difference of jurisdiction pecuniary jurisdiction every additional district judge was having the powers to hear the appeals up to 1 lakh and 50000 rupees as as far as it was applicable in punjab beyond that up to 5 lakhs it was the jurisdiction of the district judge and beyond the limit of 5000 5 lakhs the jurisdiction lay with the honorable high court but that has now been abolished every district judge or including the additional district judge has the power without any pecuniary jurisdiction third jurisdiction is inherent jurisdiction so this word is very of prime importance because inherent jurisdiction means a court which lacks inherent jurisdiction means that if a particular power has been given under a particular act to a particular authority to decide the case and the jurisdiction of the civil court is barred or is taken away then that very court on which the jurisdiction has been conferred will have the power to decide the case and the civil court will be lacking the inherent lack of jurisdiction i give you one example under the income tax act when the assessment is made by the assessing officer then there are hierarchy of officers appellate authorities divisional authorities and then the honorable high court under the writ jurisdiction that has to be decided in income tax matters in assessment of income tax matters sales tax matters gst matters powers have been given under the peculiar jurisdiction powers to that very authorities which have been constituted under those very acts so in view of that the civil court will have no jurisdiction to entertain and try this question of assessment of this one now the second example which can be taken into consideration is under the rent act under the rent act where it is applicable in the municipal limits the jurisdiction has been granted to the rent controller to order the eviction of the tenant on certain grounds provided under the rent act the power of the civil court is thus barred civil court cannot order the eviction of a tenant if the civil court orders the eviction of a tenant then that order or the judgment or the decree is beyond the inherent powers of the court and it's barred and is a nullity it can be challenged anywhere it cannot be executed it cannot be implemented so there are three type of jurisdictions one is territorial jurisdiction second is pecuniary jurisdiction and then third is the inherent lack of jurisdiction so jurisdiction has to be interpreted and understood in that very sense in which we are using the it then it has the jurisdiction to try all suits of civil nature suit must be of a civil nature now as far as the civil nature is concerned it has not been defined anywhere 
in the code of civil procedure that what is the suit of civil nature a human mind can conceive any type of suit there cannot be any limit or there cannot be any categorization of the suits but the honorable court has to see that whether the dispute between the parties is of civil nature then if it is of civil nature then the suit is maintainable before the civil court in one of the judgments of the honorable supreme court of india it has been stated that a man can become uh, can bring a suit of any nature provided its cognizance has not been impliedly or expressly barred i will be dealing with the words expressly or impliedly barred at a later part of my discussion so civil nature the suit must be of civil nature a right to an religious office suppose there is a dispute regarding mahanship of a particular property particular mat then that is a suit of civil nature though certain ceremonies have been provided for appointment of the man but right to vote that is not a civil right that is not a civil right right to vote has been conferred on us on every citizen of india under the constitution of india so if the right to vote is violated then the jurisdiction will lie under the writ jurisdiction of the honorable high court so keeping in view this fact that the civil suit can be brought in a civil court which is not expressly or impliedly barred in certain acts the uh, jurisdiction of the civil court is expressly barred in which there is a provision there is a section which says that the jurisdiction of the civil court is expressly barred now we take the example of a case under surface act in that the jurisdiction of the civil court under section 34 is expressly barred no civil court can adjudicate upon the matter so once there is an express bar contained in the section itself regarding the trial of the suit then certainly that suit cannot be tried by the civil court whenever the matter will be brought regarding any matter touching the surface act then that suit has to be brought before the appropriate authorities debt recovery tribunal or debt recovery appellate tribunal etc etc so impliedly barred impliedly barred means where a mechanism has been given for redressal of the grievances of a regarding an order passed by a particular officer under that under a particular act then the jurisdiction of the civil court is impliedly barred so that is an bar contained impliedly not expressly so express means it has to be expressly said in the act and impliedly means that if a special mechanism has been given under a particular act for redressal of the grievances for challenging the order passed under the particular act then certainly the jurisdiction of the civil court is barred so what has to be considered one has to keep in mind and it has to be considered that whether the suit is of a civil nature whether that is cognizable by the civil court whether it has not been expressly or impliedly barred if it is expressly barred and we bring the suit in a civil court ultimately it is going to be dismissed if it is impliedly barred then it is going to be dismissed as far as the inherent lack of jurisdiction is concerned as i have discussed earlier even then the suit is barred if the court does not have the pecuniary jurisdiction that may be a irregularity in trial the judgment can be set aside only on that ground but the suit can be transferred to the court which will have the pecuniary jurisdiction so as far as the territorial 
jurisdiction is concerned if the court does not find that there is a territorial jurisdiction conferred on it then the provision is contained under order 7 where the court can order the return of the plate to be presented before the appropriate court which will have the territorial jurisdiction over the matter so we will be discussing order 7 when it will come to that because certain provisions of cpc are intermingled with each other they are they cannot be read in isolation they are to be read in conjunction with each other so it cannot be said that every provision in the cpc is an independent provision now as far as sections are concerned i may remind you that certain sections in the cpc lay down the substantive law whereas certain sections only deal with the procedural law it is a mixed mixture of both substantive and procedural law section 9 is a substantive section which confers or lays down substantive right of the parties so a separate right of the court to try the suit it is not a procedural law that has to be kept in mind unless and until we go through the section in its depth we will not be able to do justice or we will be committing a mistake which will result in miscarriage of justice or wastage of time of the court wastage of time of the client besides spending lot of money unnecessarily on the trial of the case regarding which the jurisdiction is not there so certainly i had started my lecture with this substantive section of law in cpc now in the next lecture we will be discussing the cpc in a very different manner you will say that how the manner can be different i'll be discussing with you that when a client approaches you with this problem then how you are to deal with it and what are the problems which you will be facing how you have to draft the suit how you have to choose the parties how you have to seek the relief etc 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 so i think that any doubt which may linger in your mind or crop up in your mind regarding section 9 can be will stand cleared and if still there is any query please write your comments or query regarding this section i will be pleased to reply to each and every query put forth by you regarding this section again i will say and request that you should purchase my book become a successful advocate because in that i have tried to give all the details as to how you have to prepare the case how you have to take the facts and all other materials which are required for becoming a successful advocate thank you